On behalf of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist Leninist, I'd like to thank the organizers of the seminar for inviting us to this august meeting and giving us the opportunity to exchange our views with you. The topic I'm speak going to speak on is color revolution. Obviously, it is connected with the question of cultural hegemony as well. One goes with, goes with the other. And the first point I'd really like to make is no one can destroy the communist movement except the communist movement itself. If you look at the history of socialism for the last one century, you will find that the biggest destroyers of the socialist movement have been the people who claim to be communists. First, there were the social democrats, as the communists used to be called before the First World War. And most of the social democratic parties betrayed socialism and joined their bourgeoisie during the, during the first, first World War. The only people who stayed loyal to the principles of Marxism and what became Leninism were, of course, the Bolsheviks of Russia. And they made a signal contribution not only to the development of world history, but also to bringing the war to an end. Lenin had all his life insisted that the struggle against war is useless unless it's connected with the struggle against imperialism. Unless you want to overthrow imperialism, you cannot put an end to the war. And the Bolshevik Revolution was a living testimony to the correctness of that assertion of Lenin's, which for us has become a watchword. As long as there is imperialism, there can be no peace. The whole idea that is put forward by certain comrades and socialists that we can now have peace and prosperity and it's a different era and Lenin's thesis does not work, I think is not a correct assertion. And that fierce class struggle that is going on internationally, particularly in the last five, seven years, the United States of America is fighting on the one hand the People's Republic of China and on the other hand the Russian Federation makes it clear that the class struggle is very much there. There's an old Chinese saying that the tree may prefer the calm, but the wind will not subside. We may want peace, and we do want peace. We may want prosperity, and we do want prosperity, but there will be no peace for the overwhelming majority of humanity, and there will be no prosperity until imperialism is overthrown. Imperialism comrades seeks domination. Whatever its language, no matter how sublime the language, and with the development of class contradictions, the language of the ruling classes, exploiting classes, always becomes sublime. They may talk of human rights, they, they, they may talk of freedom, they may talk of democracy, they may talk of rule of law, but at the end of the day, there's only one freedom they value, the freedom of one person to exploit another, and the freedom of a few tiny handful of imperialist nations to exploit the majority of the nations of the world. That's the only freedom that, that they seek. And most of the time, they talk of human rights and democracy. But every now and then, in their unguarded moments, the spokesmen, be they military, be they diplomatic, be they political, be they ideological, spokesmen of imperialism, blurt out the truth that what the whole thing is about. From, taken from George Kennan, at the end of the Second World War, where he said, America represents 5% of the world's population, but it owns 5% of the world's wealth, and we want to continue that way. We do not want to change it, and whatever our language, we have to be not sentimental, we've got to forget about human rights, rule of law, and democracy. We've got to maintain that position. And that is, of course, repeated again and again from time to time. The reactionary, uh, American journalist Thomas Friedman famously said, and I really need to read this quotation, the hidden hand of the market will never work without the hidden fist. McDonald's cannot flourish without McDonald Douglas, the designer of F-15 fighter plane. And the hidden fist that keeps the world safe for the Silicon Valley technologies is called the US Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps. So you can see the connection between the free market and the American military, Navy, Navy and, and, and her armed forces. And that's really what, what they mean, mean by freedom. Have our McDonald's, if you won't have it, we're going to send our Navy and Prussian missiles. Have our General Motors produced in your country, but if you don't agree to it, if you won't open up, that, that's the punishment we, we, we will give, give you. And this is really what we have to do. They don't give about a damn about human rights. 
after the first Gulf War, which was supposed to be about the liberation of Kuwait, even after the Iraqi army had evacuated uh, Kuwait, the Americans, the British, and their allies kept a no-fly zone over northern Iraq and imposed draconian sanctions, which claimed the lives of over a million people, including 500,000 children. And when Madam, Madam Albright, at that time, the U.S. representative on the United Nations was asked, is the price worth paying? Why do you keep sanctions? She said, it is well worth paying. This is their human rights. 500,000 Iraqi children done to death, death through sanctions, through preventable diseases, because they were not allowed to import food and medicine, is worth paying. That is their value on, 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 on human life. When people talk about cultural imperialism, it really bothers me. How is it possible for them to present their culture against our culture as being superior? The culture of imperialism is what? Exploitation, extreme inequality, prostitution, drugs, trafficking, street crime, and war after war. That is what their culture is. Against that, we are the representatives of the highest achievements of human culture, namely the science of Marxism-Leninism. We should be able to put that science in a spirited way rather than shy way. Instead of saying, we won't talk about Marx and gay people annoy us. We won't talk about anger, Lenin, Stalin, Marxism, because it will put people off. But if people are going to be put off because they are being told how their liberation is going to come about, let them be put off. They don't deserve liberation. We need to take this message to the, to the working class. You in China, comrades, are in a better position than us. We are a small organization in a, the oldest imperialist country in, in Britain. We try to do our best, and believe you me, our party is growing because we don't shy away from the topics which are considered to be not fashionable. We are not fashion lovers. It's not that we wear Marxism Leninism because it's the latest fashion in Paris, or Milan, or wherever it, it may be. We wear it because it represents the truth. And like Galileo, we've got to say, it still moves. Marxism, Leninism, the science of liberation of the working class, and there's no way that the working class can achieve liberation without this, this science. And we've got to keep on putting it forward, particularly when it's not fashionable because of historical circumstances. If you won't put it now, there never will be a time when, when you will be able to put forward. The Bolsheviks fought for the science of Marxism for a whole 20 years. They fought against opportunism for a whole 20 years. That's precisely why they were successful in November 1917. And it is a great tribute to them that they've left, left behind us the lessons of the fight against imperialism and the fight against <coughs> opportunism. Imperialism, of course, in order to achieve its domination, employs a combination of crude, brutal military force and, of course, propaganda. And it substitutes one for the other, or supplements one, one with the other. Where they're not able to achieve by armed forces, previous speakers this morning have said, they can't always succeed. After the Korean War, they realized they could not defeat China in the battlefield. After the Second World War, they realized the Soviet Union could not be defeated by an armed onslaught. If she could defeat almost single-handedly the might of the mightiest military power, namely Nazi Germany, she could not be defeated in the battlefield. So they get on with sabotaging, and we've got to actually guard against the sabotage. And the only way we can guard, and this is the only way we have learned of guarding our ideology, is through propagating our ideology everywhere, among the masses of people, among the intelligentsia, among our party members. Why do we concede to imperialism? Why do we concede to capitalism the high ground? One of the things that after the October Revolution used to be said by the economists and ideologues of imperialism was communism will never work. Why? Because they were abolished exploitation. Without exploitation, they said there could be no proper accounting, there could be no economics. Communists dismissed that assertion with supreme contempt and the Soviet Union went on to build socialism in a world historic fashion. It was the building of socialism that enabled the Soviet Union to defeat Nazi Germany at the end, at the end of, uh, end of the second, uh, during the second, second World War. But after that, after the, 
the death of Stalin, the Christian wife started conceding that capitalism and the market were the only way of bringing prosperity. Once you conceive this, there is nothing for Marxism to do except disappear from the scene. If planned economy, if the Marxist economics cannot deliver peace and, peace and prosperity, if it cannot bring uh, unleashed, unlimited production for the benefit of humanity, then capitalism is the last stage of humanity's development and there is nothing beyond to look. And we might as well pack up and join the pack of capitalists and say that the market is the only force. The market, of course, corrodes. It not only destroys the economy, it also destroys people in the ideological sphere. And the effects of the market have been such in the Soviet Union. Is it possible that 20 million members of the Soviet Communist Party, who could have single-handedly defeated Yeltsin and his forces, they literally could have throttled him with their bare hands without the guns. And they went away because they were ideologically hollowed out. And there's a lesson to be learned for remaining socialist countries, that if they want to survive as socialist states, they've got to fight against opportunism that comes with the distortion and falsification of, of Marxism. Imperialists could not defeat socialism by armed force, so they got on with sabotage. They did that as soon as the Soviet state had been established. They did that after the Second World War. And when that was being done, they didn't always achieve much success. There were uprisings in the early 50s, in East Germany, in Poland, in Hungary, and they were easily suppressed by the local communist parties with the help of the Soviet Union. But they struck lucky in 1968 during what is known as the Prague Spring. The Communist Party itself had become rotten, and they wanted socialism with a human face, which is a what? Which is a euphemism for saying we don't want communism. You know, we want capitalism because apparently only capitalism has a human face. We communists have a monstrous face. We cannot have that because the moment you apply it. it the economics of Marxism, the moment you actually implement the dictatorship of the proletariat, then they say it's a Stalinist totalitarianism. Okay. And of course, Stalin's name became quite disreputable after the 20th Party Congress and what the Khrushchevites had done. And so people don't want to be Stalinists. Well, I want to be a Stalinist. I have no shame in calling myself a Stalinist because Stalin's period in the history of the world communist movement was the brightest period Every glory achieved by the working class movement has been achieved during that period. And, and the Chinese comrades also achieved great glories when they were following that particular line. And therefore, really, uh, the comrade chairman has told me I have got one minute, and my one minute probably is o -o 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 over already. And all I want to say is please read my paper and read the larger version, which I will send as soon as I, as I re reach London. And thank you very, very much for inviting us.